Ladies and gentlemen, we're back for another week. Episode 35 is still brought to you by Onnit. Onnit.com slash hot. O-N-N-I-T dot com slash hot. If you go to that, you're going to land on their Alpha Brain trial. I have talked about it previously. Alpha Brain is designed around uh, memory and focus, and uh, I've already messed up two times on the free trial that they are currently offering. I think I've said twice, the two previous episodes, that if you click on the button and sign up, it's going to give you a bottle of 60. Yeah, that's not correct. If you buy a bottle, it's going to come in 30 or 60 or 90, I believe. But the trial is 14. So if you're interested and what you should be interested in doing, you go to onnit.com slash hot, go about halfway down, and just click on the video of Joe Rogan. He's wearing a tight shirt, a tight pair of pants. He's talking about it. That's all you should need to know. And beyond that, if you are interested in looking at the other stuff that Onnit has to offer, in the upper left-hand side, you'll see Onnit and then the little vertical line and then Alpha Brain. Click on the Onnit, which I'm doing right now. It'll take you more to the uh, Onnit homepage where you have a lot of different op- options against uh, along the top. I personally... People ask me all the time, type of things that I take, and I'm going to say what I said when I first did a advertisement for Onnit. Supplements are great, but no amount of supplements is going to get you out of a garbage disposal diet. You need to look at supplements as the micro of your life and the way that you eat and train and rest and recover as the macro of your life. If the macro is a mess, you're going to have really expensive pee. That's about what this breaks down to. So if you can dial in some of that other stuff, workout, stress level, recovery, diet, then you can start looking at doing some, or I I mean, you can look at doing it whatever you want to, but if you really want to optimize, you would look at doing it after you maximize the macro. So to answer the questions of the stuff that I actually take, if you click on the supplement tab, come down, I take the total primate care. It comes in a day pack and a night pack. Very, very easy to just take a handful of pills and you're kind of good to go for the day. Again, those are micro type things, vitamins, minerals, same at night. Another one I haven't tried, but I'm actually going to pretty soon here. I want to try this on it. Total gut health. I've constantly heard people talking about the, uh, the state of your gut health and how much it can have an effect on your life. I've never really looked at it, but it's something that I do want to try. Another thing I've been trying recently is the uh, shroom track shroom. Wow. Shroom track shroom tech as a pre-workout. Most of the time for a pre-workout, I have a cup of coffee. I've messed around with in my earlier days of taking pills that I'm pretty sure were laced with methamphetamines. And I'm not going to lie. The performance in the gym was awesome. And the stomach ache and the shakes afterwards was not awesome. So I went away from all of that. If anything, cup of black coffee. But I have been messing around with the Shroom Tech. I actually heard Joe talking about this the other day. It's not like a turbo boost. It's it, You'll feel a difference, but it's only going to feel like if you had a four-speed car before, you're going to feel like maybe you had a fifth speed. So those are the ones that I take uh, pretty much on the daily and another one that I cannot recommend enough is the uh, protein bars and the protein bites. Those things are ridiculous. Just don't eat too many because you need to eat real food as well, but that's it. If you want to go check it out on it.com slash H O T the opposite of cold. And that's that for that episode 35. My guest today uh, is a very good friend. And he's a friend that I met at the very beginning of my career, literally probably within the first few days of walking across the quarter deck, which is naval terminology for front door of SEAL Team 5, which was my first duty station. After, you know, you join the Navy, you go to boot camp, or at least this is the route that I took. It's changed since I was in the military. I joined the Navy. I went to boot camp. I had to pick an occupational specialty because the attrition rate in BUDS was so high. I picked my specialty based off the shortest school available, which at the time happened to be OSA school or operations specialist, a school. It's a radar scope operator. Still haven't seen one to this day. Checked into buds, graduated buds. Our entire class went to Fort Benning, Georgia to learn how to commit controlled suicide out of a C-130 jumping static line. Got done with that and then checked into my first uh, actual duty station. Even though all of those things along the way were duty stations, this was my first permanent duty station. And John, 
was managing the dive locker at SEAL Team 5 at the time that I checked in. And he actually took uh, myself and a very good friend at the time named Jason on our first climbing trip, which leads into a little bit of his background because it's very diverse. So John spent 26 years in the Navy. Most of that time, I'll say two decades of that, associated with and directly attached to the SEAL teams. He knows as much about the SEAL teams as I do. He's probably spent, I mean, if he did 20 years in the teams, he's got three more years in the teams than I have. But it's, I would say it's atypical for somebody who is a diver to spend that much time in the SEAL teams because they have their own occupational specialty and their own career path inside of the Navy. And he is a climbing expert. Uh, wealth of knowledge when it comes to the outdoors, it, climbing, backcountry, skiing, snow safety, rope work, all of those type of things. He spent 15 years as the AOIC, which is the assistant officer in charge of the detachment in Kodiak, Alaska, which is responsible for cold weather training and survival training. All of the students now are routed through there before they go to their first SEAL team, which is also different than when I went through. After leaving the military, he did a short period of time at Beyond, which is a not a footwear apparel. They're an apparel or survival system manufacturer that focuses on what I'm going to call, I hate the term the tip of the spear because I think it's been bastardized and too many people use it. They focus on the apex communities. And we actually get into that a little bit in the podcast. So I'll let that get covered when it gets covered. And now currently is the big game product manager for Sitka. Sitka is a hunting brand to say the least. They make gear for waterfowl, for whitetail hunting. They have some categories like big game and my personal favorite, subalpine, which just happened to be developed underneath John's purview. And we talk about that a little bit as well. So crazy diverse career inside of the military. Oh yeah, he's also been a bow hunter for 30 years. I should have opened with that because that's obviously the most important thing on his resume. Taking all of that experience, now working for Sitka and designing gear systems, I should say, that uh, help people not only survive but thrive in the outdoors, whether you're hunting or, you know, maybe just like being outside. You don't have to hunt people. If you don't want to hunt, don't hunt. I dig it. If you want to check out their stuff, go to SitkaGear.com. And uh, if you're anything like me, you'll spend hours there looking through pictures, watching product videos. It's a, it's a rabbit hole that feel free to go down, but I digress. Episode 35 with the survival expert, John Barklow. Okay. I got the red smoke. Gun run north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay. Copy west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. I feel like I got hit with a baseball bat (laughs) repeatedly. I hate bow hunting and I can't wait for our next trip. It's a, I don't even know how to describe it. Like we were saying at breakfast, I think my favorite part of this week was listening to somebody else describe how they came unraveled in the moment. (laughs) They counted because she was basically describing how every shot process works for me. Where you, <laughs> how, how can you, how can I encapsulate this? She shot great at a target, a block, and then they moved out the block distance, and she felt super comfortable. And then she crawled for days, days. Finally, got a shot, and when the target had four legs and a pulse. <laughs> The world changed and went upside down, and you're trying to think about a hundred different things. How did she describe it? Line up the circles. There's a bubble. There's a pin. <laughs> There's some colored <laughs> string in front of my eye. <laughs> uh, yeah, frustrating would be the week, or not the week, would be the word I would use to describe this week. So we're in Lanai, Hawaii, hunting axis deer. How would you describe your week? Blissful. <laughs> you're such a liar. Um, humbling, frustrating, enjoyable. 
And you've been bow hunting for how long? 30 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, I... It's one of the more frustrating, challenging, frustrating hunts. I mean, I'm, I'm laying in bed this morning. I woke up. I'm trying to replay every shot. Arrows it hit. Arrows it didn't. And I'm like, what can I do better? I'm not going to lie. I was laying in bed a few nights, and I would literally almost sit upright from the... And in my head, I would hear, meow. <laughs> <laughs> Which, for people who've never been busted by a female axis deer, you will, or I did, devoted an inordinate amount of my time trying to be an invisible bush, maneuvering slowly towards a male axis deer, and I would be, I thought I was invisible, I thought I was the best stock ever, and then from somewhere I didn't see, you hear, meow, and you're done. I think we mastered that, actually. Yeah. One of the most, I don't know, it, I know that I don't have a ton of bow hunting experience, but I would say it's an 80% frustration, 20% joyous experience. I think it's, I equate it to golf. You could have a terrible round of golf, 17 holes of terrible golf, and have the 18th hole be phenomenal, and you're walking into the pro shop to buy a new set of golf clubs. <laughs> Whereas before that, you were like breaking your driver over your knee and throwing it into the bush, but it just takes one. Like yesterday, when the wind shifted, I guess it's you gotta you gotta lay it out a little bit. So we were here for six days of hunting. I would say the first five days were challenging to say the least. So there's no wind, swirling wind, light wind, hot out. The animals would lay down, which you can't see them. In, and, invisible. Yeah. Invisible. And we were out grinding it out, putting miles underneath our feet, just going and looking for these things. And I would say we had some success. I think we can both agree the first success we had should not have happened in any normal world. No, we had to force it, you know, but but we got it done. But then the wind shifted, and yesterday was like complain, like playing a completely different sport. Yeah. We actually went out, and it was consistent, and we were with a guy that, um, I don't know, probably speaks to those animals at a Bluetooth level back and forth <laughs> to say he has an understanding of what was going on, but that was a 20%, right? It went from being frustrating to... Cool. What what's next? <laughs> but you you know every species is different. You know try to try to hunt a white-tailed deer. <clears throat> you know in the summer, not rutting, not on a food pattern. You know or try to hunt elk when they're not bugling. Whatever it is, you have to exploit the whatever the species. You have to try to exploit their weakness. And when you have everything stacked against you and everything in the favor of the animal, like dude, it's just there's nothing to exploit. And it's tough. And then that one day, the wind shifted, and all of a sudden, we're getting 25, 30 yards from bucks. Yeah. We're getting 50 yards from herds of hundreds of deer. And for the for people who don't understand the difference, in the five days previous to that, we would probably get 200 yards from those animals, which were the bows, obviously, out of range. Yeah. And they're still kind of knowing you're there. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're going from 5.30 in the morning <laughs> till 7.30 til at night. Just trying to make something happen, trying to walk into that one scenario, and we did. I mean, a couple times. You know, all in all, we did all right. What, we're bringing three deer each out of here. I quit multiple times inside during this week, though. Like, I give up, and then I would round a corner, and there's a deer. I'm like, okay, I'm back in, coach. <laughs> but to me, that's what makes bow hunting so addicting. Like, you have to maybe be a bit of a sadistic person, but... When it happens, it is so incredible. Like the gal we were talking about, like when she finally does put it all together, she's already addicted. Yeah. But when she finally puts it all together, I, I can't wait to talk to her and, and hear about it. I think what was cool was to watch her. What did she have? She had a recurve. <laughs> she had a compound. <laughs> Actually, two compounds. One, uh, One's just a... I would say a completely different design. What's the name of the thing? A gearhead? A gearhead. Sp- very, yeah. I don't know how to describe it. It almost looked like... Something by a nine-year-old. It would look normal yeah, size in her like hands. A it's yeah. a micro-sized bow, which in this environment actually makes a ton of sense now. I understand why the guides out here use that thing. So she, on her first day, had a suite of weapons to choose from. <laughs> on the first day of hunting, we went out there, realized she had no broadheads, so she kind of <laughs> just watched from the truck. Mind you, this woman is a world-class, I would say, spear fisherman. She is, yeah. Local to uh, native of the Hawaiian Islands, so obviously familiar with being out here. But she was having so much fun just crawling around. 
and not getting to really shoot and just watching the animals. And I think all of us at the end of the day, the first question, you know, did she get a shot? Did she get a shot? And it was, I, yeah, it was honestly my favorite part of the trip to sit, sit there and recognize in her the exact same feelings that I've had. Yeah. When it just completely comes apart. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, I got this. <laughs> then you look at the animal and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be okay. <laughs> she's going to be thinking about it for months. It's going to be awesome. And, but she's got lots of opportunities. She can come back. Yeah. And, uh, the opportunities definitely existed. I think we just got unlucky with the wind. Even, but like you said, even then we forced it. We made it happen. And yeah, my knees are sore from crawling. We, my lower back is sore from being bent over. I don't know how to train for that. I don't know how to train for crawling and hunching over and like doing the hobbit walk totally bent over. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that. I think instead of doing like wind sprints, you know, like you could take a standard CrossFit workout. And just like put a pack on or a weighted vest and just hunch over and do like 200 yard <laughs> like walks. Like seriously, what would you do? I don't. Do I got to do more Turkish get ups? Like, well, I mean, you definitely don't want to load your body in that compromised posture. I felt like I had spina bifida by Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, I don't. It's like you, you find yourself just hunched over because you're trying to get behind a bush and then you're walking. You're like, oh, my lower back hurts. And we're not the smallest people in the world. No. Yeah, if you're under six foot tall, I don't like you at all, especially when it comes to the hunting world. I honestly don't. I mean, imagine adding six inches and being Dudley's height, and he gets it done. He must have a back of steel. Yeah. He just wears those goofy decoy hats on his head. You know, I thought about that, too, because we were talking about that. Like, a cow elk, would it be close enough that you could maneuver? Because if you could do that and do the little muse that Jason was doing... Like, especially during the rut. Dude, I think they would be running at you. Certainly the bulls, or the bucks, I guess I call them. I don't know. And then there's Mark, who... I mean, we have to talk about his techniques a little bit. We won't give his last name, because I don't know if he wanted to share them <laughs> before he puts in uh, the copyright and trademark paperwork on his hunting techniques. But he crawled more than anybody here. He was solo, complete John Rambo. He would get dropped off. He would not come out of the field. Every time I saw him, he had a fresh coat of mud on his face. He was talking about making leave fans, putting leaves in his head. Uh, and then yesterday, he essentially nuded up from the waist down. He left his boxers on, thank God, because nobody needs to see that. And uh, walked around so much in just his socks and boxers that he has a coat of pink on his lower body that's going to hurt him for days. Days. Because he was at... The absolute bottom of the barrel. What do I do from here? And he got it done at last light on the last day after looking for his backpack. For <laughs> he was literally pulling out all the stops. He's like, it's so noisy trying to walk through that stuff. And he, he's like, I can walk through grass more or far quieter when I'm naked. And that, then he did it. Like to have the thought, okay, that's one thing. But that's how but he far executed he got- on it. And yeah. took his shoes off. That's how far he got driven into the abyss, though. Well, these axis deer will just <laughs> ring you out. He, his, we ran into him at the grocery store that one day yeah. for lunch, and he, he literally didn't want to talk about what had just happened previously. He got a snack and dove back in, and at the end of the day, had multiple stories about what had happened just previous to lunch. It's yeah, it's so frustrating. And then to see him last night at last light, smile on his awesome. face, great buck, and he's talking about going hunting the next morning. Yeah. I tried to sleep in because we actually finally had the day off, and I couldn't sleep in, literally waking up with a racing heart. Meow. <laughs> if he can even put pants on today, I'd be surprised. That's how burned he is. He might... He's, he's going to have to walk around in a jock strap, I think, yeah, for he's, days. He's going to need to invest Inside. in some aloe vera for sure. But I mean... I don't know. I guess when you get that frustrated, he, th- so again, six days of hunting. He finally got it done in probably the last five minutes of six days. Yeah, literally. Five, the, I mean, the last bit of shooting light. <sighs> when are we coming back? <laughs> I'm already thinking about it. <laughs> no kidding. So You got to get the trade wins. Yeah. Well, I mean, how can you gauge that, though, too? I mean, if you book months in advance, you're kind so, of taking a crapshoot, right? Yeah. So... Because you can't count on that, the one thing you can count on is the rut. And like Jason's like, June's a totally different ball game. 
I don't think I've ever... You're exploiting more weaknesses. They're running up. The males are kind of acting like knuckleheads. You can call them. They yep. can call them. You can rattle them in. I'm still... I think yet... I think I've seen a rut. It was for elk in late September in Utah. I, it's for a day. <laughs> I, well, because I have yet to see because when I went back later, it actually was able to get my elk. Yeah, they were behaving completely differently. <laughs> but for that one day in the valley that I was in, I we couldn't have had this conversation because they were so yeah loud. I didn't see them doing anything crazy, like, but I also don't. Uh, I've heard people describe it in a lot of ways, like they're just they're not thinking as clearly because they're thinking about reproducing. Obviously, I didn't yeah. necessarily see that, but they were really, really, really loud. What month? That was September, yeah, in uh, in Utah. So, yeah. th- other than them barking like that or bugling, that's really the only animal I've ever seen behaving like I've never I've never seen a deer in the rut. So, I'd be interested to see how it changes their behavior. <laughs> so the, the reason I'm laughing is because wait till our elk hunt in September. Like literally, dude, it's like ten at night, and you're like, "Will you please just shut the hell up?" <laughs> it is insane. It's insane, dude. It's if you can if you can hit it like that. It's the coolest, most primal thing you've yeah. ever, you've ever been around. The day I was successful on the elk, I was in the morning. They were bugling again, and there was frost on the ground. It was like a cold morning that was heating up throughout the day, yeah. and it was probably the most majestic noises in that valley. And I was just watching elk that had frost on their racks, bugling as steam was coming out. I would have been completely happy sitting there just watching them all day long. Yeah. I didn't realize they only bugle in, uh, in the rut, and then the rest of the time they're quiet. Well, if you're lucky, they bugle during the rut. There's some areas with a lot of predators, um, areas that get a lot of pressure. Yeah. Like, they won't. They'll do it maybe at night, or they'll do it just till, till literally sun up. And then it's, it's, it's even more frustrating than hunting axis here. Because the thing with axis, they're there. Like, there's hundreds of them. You'll, you'll find them. But you're not going to go through a forest and hope you bump into a bull. I think... I will say I know for a fact I did things out here that I would never do on any other no. type of hunt because of the fact if we did look around, it's like, oh, okay, let's go this direction and there's more of them. Yeah, you could take a chance because if you blew yeah. it, you'd, you'd, you know, chances are 20 minutes later you'd run into something else. I would be terrified to do that even in the environment where I was at where we could see a lot of the bulls that were moving around in that same place in Utah. I would have been scared. Or I, I shouldn't say I would be scared. I know that I couldn't get away with a lot of the things that I was able to get away with. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I hate it. So I got to start practicing again tomorrow when I get home. <laughs> I've already got a list of things I need to do. A couple more things I need to buy. And you've some been work this, I need to do yeah. on my bow. That's you've been why at I this love 30 it, years. Man. That's why I love it. I am literally addicted to it. I mean, my wife, God love her. She's like, she just shakes her head. She's like, what are you like? What are you doing with your bow? Like my buddy when I lived in Alaska, you know, he'd come over because I had the bow press. We'd be there for a weekend. She's like, what are you doing? stuff aaron's aaron's string stretch a little bit it's like a 16th <laughs> off and she's like what and i'm like yeah no seriously and she's like i just okay i get it like jamie will call me and she's like hey no just checking in how's your day going I'm like it sucks leave me alone <laughs> i hate this and she, she'll pause for a second why do you do this why are you hunting this is supposed to be fun I'm like well it's not all right leave me alone hold on i gotta go there's an animal over there <laughs> i swear in the course of 30 years i've I probably, you know, probably come back to the truck and, and said to myself, that's it, I'm done, I'm quitting. <laughs> and then like literally before I get home, I'm already strategizing. I told you, I came back yeah. from that, this one hunt, I'm by myself, I get back, like days and days, backpacking around, I whiff a shot. And I'm so pissed off and like the seven or eight hour hike out, I'm just like fuming, like hike angry, that's, that's, a, that's a... You got one shot in that whole time. Yeah, one. And I get back to the truck you know, it's just an open pickup truck, and I have a trekking pole in my hand, and I'm just so pissed off. And I throw the trekking pole, and the thing bounces in the back of the tr- the truck and just touches the back of my window and shatters the back of the window on my truck. <laughs> and I was just about ready to. I was just about ready to quit. I was about ready to try to break the bow over my knee at that. I was going to say that's. You, I probably would have gone and started beating the back <laughs> of my truck with the bow. A couple drinks. A little bit of time to cool off. I'm, I'm out there to the next day practicing, you know. It is amazing. I think I'm in the same boat. Like, I'll get so frustrated, and I'll, you'll get to that point where it's like, okay, I can't take this anymore. And then two minutes later, you're thinking, okay, what if I did this? What if I did that? What if I changed that? What could I do to make sure that that didn't happen? So 
I don't know. It's but a, that's the kind of people we are. That I mean, there's some people that just it, they have no interest in it. Yeah. And some people that get into it and really just don't understand what it's all about. Like, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Do not watch a hunting show and think that in 30 minutes, five animals are going to hit the ground. Yeah. Fortunately, I hadn't watched a lot of those shows, and I tried to go into it with realistic expectations. But I will say that the frustration level is more than I thought it than I thought it would be. Because well, you can do everything right, and you still might get screwed. Like you have a great stock, and the wind could switch on you, and you're done. Yeah. And there's nothing that you can do about that, and uh, and it sucks. But and this you, is coming from a guy. I mean, you've had a lot of, you know, a lot of opportunity to hunt in a year. Like, imagine, you know, back in the day, so to speak, when there wasn't a lot of information out there, gear wasn't as good. I mean, I knew guys back. I grew up in Ohio. I knew guys that. Well, myself included. I mean, I hunted three years, three, before I ever shot one arrow at a doe. You taught yourself? Yeah. I can't imagine self-teaching archery and then archery alone without a coach or the, I mean, obviously the internet is a great resource. It is now, yeah. But, but not having that and then teaching yourself hunting by yourself. Yeah, your odds have got to be less than... One percent, single digit at the best. Yeah, my dad bird hunted, but nobody in my family, really to this day, they ever big game hunted. So, that's why I told. That's why I told Dudley, like in all sincerity, I said, "Dude, thank you. Like you have no idea what you've done for people like me. Like where I have actually, you know, somebody who's willing to share that those yep. years of experience." Um, you know, I wished I had that 20, 30 years ago. That would be incredible. So people growing up now, um, I don't even know, you know, how do you appreciate it? But no, he's literally changed the game. Like literally target archery and bow hunting, like literally changed the game. Yeah. When people, people make the mistake of asking me for advice when it comes to bows or how to get started on bow hunting. And it's my default answer. I spend a lot of time just on YouTube. I mean, I know the guy, and I could reach out to him and text him or call him, and I spent a lot of time just re-watching yeah. the YouTube videos. Or, again, okay, this is where you hold your silver back, and this is the anchor. And I, I just like you, can't, you cannot hear that stuff enough. And I think for me, for my personality, it helps to hear that constant reinforcement, and then I try to do everything I can to practice. Like, do you practice shooting from your knees? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I added seating, uh, sit, uh, seated because when I went uh, blind hunting in Texas, I had never – I had never yeah. thought that I was going to take a shot from a chair, mm -hmm. and I drew back the first time, and I was like, oh, this doesn't feel right, and just whiff. <laughs> yeah, you can find yourself in some really bizarre kind of contortions trying to draw yep. your bow. Flat on your back, draw your bow and sit up, like in antelope country when you're in tall grass. How do you keep the arrow on the rest? Finger. Wow. Yeah, even this week, I took, you know shots from my knees but super crouched down mm -hmm. where you're away from the correct contortion and the stacking of the joints and you know that it's not right but you know that if you move to the correct position you're going to get busted yeah well, i told you i forced that one shot yeah totally twisted and i know if i'm twisted a certain direction i'm probably going to push the arrow a certain direction and i did i did i knew it and i was just you know trying to shoot through a softball size hole <laughs> completely twisted up at 60 <laughs> at 60 <laughs> in the wind it's a thing. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it is a thing. You, what's your role at Sika? What's your actual title? Big game product manager. So I'm assuming you bring a lot of that 30 years of personal experience with you to that role. But did you never, how, how did you end up at Sitka? Because we'll have to get to it at some point, but you know I have known each other for quite some time. We, yeah. There was a. A gap in connection, but we, yeah. Which is very common in the military. For sure. But being the hunter that you've been hunting, so you were in Kodiak before. Mm -hmm. and we can work our way back to that because I actually want to talk quite a bit about survival and the realities of survival. But did you ever think you would work at a company like that with that? Or did that just kind of happen to fall into your lap? And because of the experience that you had, it helps you do, do the job you do now. You know, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm laying in bed. I, I wake up, 2 in the morning. I'm thinking about getting out of the government. You're in Kodiak at this point? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. And I literally, I remember that I wake up, it's 2 a.m. 
I'm like, I'm done. Like, it's time to move on. No, it, I, I mean, I had a great time, but I'm like, yeah. it's time to move on. I had that moment as well for different reasons where I woke up and I realized my body can't do this. You have to go yeah. focus on doing something yeah. else. And uh, I'm like, I got to figure this out. And I said, I got to do something that I'm passionate about. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in the hunting industry. And in my mind, this is all going through my mind like super quick. And I'm like, and there's only one company I want to work for. It's Sitka. Well, what I didn't realize at the time is the company wasn't really structured. Like my role didn't exist. Yeah. I'm the first person to hold like that title. What year was this? You had this realization? Uh, probably 2013, I think. And what year was Sitka founded? I think I got out in 2014. Um, I think 2008. Okay, so they were. I mean, well, they're still young. I would say as a company. they are still yeah. young. Yep, but yep. much younger in the story arc of where they are today. Yeah, no, it's so. Anyways, um, I didn't even know how to go about it, and just through, you know, I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but just from some bizarre, when you start looking for something, it's amazing what you can find, right? When when you're ready to to kind of reach out and accept what's out there. Uh, so, anyways, long story short. I start talking to these folks. It was like uh, an 11 month interview process. Uh, and in the meantime, I had to go get another job because I actually did get out of the government. Yep. And, uh, and I said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm still interested if you ever, uh, you know, if you ever want to talk again. Well, when, when you got out, you transitioned to beyond, right? I, I went to beyond clothing yep. for six months. Uh, awesome company, little company out of Seattle. And I was a product manager there and were you guys using your uh, using their stuff in kodiak no i had ex i got the experience with their stuff for people who don't know what beyond is yeah the survival clothing manufacturer that i would say specializes in the tier one units that's where they yeah. got their niche market yeah. was that you basically get this bag that i can't even imagine what the value i'm gonna get another drink all right that's john's hand going into the ice but you get handed this bag after selection, and the value of that bag has got to be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, easy. And, it, yeah. and it's the layering system for everything that touches your skin to the puffy layers, to the waterproof, to the windproof layers. And uh, they do – they go to direct-to-consumer, right? They don't have any retail as far as storefronts, but they'll go direct-to-consumer. So you can buy the stuff. Correct. It's expensive. It, it's really nice. It's made in the USA. It's made in the – well, it has to be very compliant, right? To, yeah, to go to, to the sell government. To sell to the government, yeah. So – it if you want to there's few things in my life that i'm willing to spend a lot of money on one of them is parachutes because they're life sustaining the other one is cold weather gear because that's also life sustaining so you how you landed it beyond you should probably talk about what you were doing in the military so a guy worked uh a guy I worked with rick elder who's the president of beyond uh he reached out he says hey i hear you're getting out need a product manager they were they were in the process of developing some pretty like specialized niche stuff yep. for like your unit for boarding and things like that. And uh, he's like, you know, come on down. And he let me, I was, I owned a home in Salt Lake. So we were already, you know, plans were in place. And so I would commute back and forth for a week or two at a time. And I got a lot of work done in six months, got a lot of stuff done. And, and Rick really gave me my start, so to speak, or my credentials outside of the government you know we all know that that transition is not an easy one and you don't know necessarily that the skills and knowledge you have how it translates so anyways rick gave me my start and uh it damn near broke my heart when Sika called back and said hey we want to bring you in for another interview and i'll get to why they did that here in a second but uh you know and i had to tell rick and he's great i mean we're still good good friends you know and they're doing really well but um but so they call me back, and they're like, hey, we'd like to bring you in for, for another interview. I think I did a phone screen for another phone interview. But the reason why is our friend George, <laughs> right, Yep, is friends with Jonathan Hart, one of the founders of Sitka. George knows everybody. We he does. We start there. He does. And uh, they're riding a chairlift, I think, in Squaw, George and Jonathan. And, uh, you know, I don't, George says something basically like, Hey, so have you ever, uh, you know, filled that role for big game product manager, which Jonathan basically as the founder was doing, right? That was the foundational part of the company. And, uh, he says, no, no, we haven't, haven't, haven't filled that yet. And George is like, man, I'm telling you, you gotta, you gotta look at my buddy, John, like, 
And he's like, John who? He's like, John Barclow. He's like, John Barclow? He goes, yeah, we've interviewed him. And that was, they, I, I actually credit George with getting me over the hump uh, and getting me the face-to-face interview. And then, you know, they hired me like a couple weeks later. And George, you worked with, or for, I guess, remotely. Yeah. In the military. Who yes. Was, he's George also, was the operations officer. Yeah. I was the AOIC up in Kodiak, yep. And he is also the connection that hooks us up here. <laughs> he is. Yeah, and I think he might have helped us reconnect face to face as well too. The guy's amazing. He is, he knows everybody. I'm convinced, and knows how to do almost everything. And like I like I said yesterday, all I can say is my back still hurts from carrying him through buds. <laughs> For the four weeks we were in the same class, he got shin splints, which is also known as bitch legs in the business. <laughs> No, George is an awesome guy. I mean, phenomenal dude. Well connected. Uh, he's a he's a Renaissance man. He sure. is absolutely a re- he won't admit that, but he is a Renaissance man. And if people don't know who I'm talking about, it's episode 32. Jack Carr is the same George that I'm talking <laughs> about. I and mean, he posts pictures of himself. Yeah, so he's not trying to completely. Yeah, stay we out. don't have to. Uh, we don't have to give his last name out or his home address. But uh, yeah, I mean that's it's unbelievable to me. So you went. So we'll go backwards. Big Game Manager at Sitka, Beyond Clothing, AOIC at Kodiak, Alaska. Yeah. What is Kodiak, Alaska? Yeah, so... The the facility that you worked at. Yeah, so the facility, um, and I'll I'll probably get this slightly wrong, but it started in like 19, say 85, 6, 7, somewhere in there, uh, to train Navy SEALs to basically fight fight in uh northern asia so china and i would say north, slash survive north korea Martins. fight probably 50 yeah, percent survive another 50 percent. i mean in my opinion yeah absolutely at or near the top um of the most harsh environment you can you can try to survive in uh so anyways i got up there right after well, September 11th, right? They changed all our lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was at SEAL Team 5 working in uh, sub-ops or diving, whatever they called it back then. And that's right when I left. So I think that's where our departure... Yes, well, that's where everybody's departure went, right? I mean, yeah. everybody got scattered. Um, and so I was working there, and I had been passionately pursuing um, my mountain guide credentials to try to be a... Um, you know, maybe a professional, professional climbing guide, ski guide. Hmm. Um, I'd already taken a few platoons out and given them some, uh, some winter training, some summer training, some rock climbing, some, you know, different things like that. Anyways, and I knew the, uh, the master chief up there at Kodiak. Well, anyways, when September 11th happened, the reality was, even though we still played around, that truly the team's cold weather and what I'll call mountain skills or mountain survival skills had, had perished with the cold war. Like most of those guys who had done that were retired or, or they were at like team two. E- exactly. It was, it was very, very concentrated back then the I, way it was organized. I try to tell people like we won all the engagements right after nine 11, but you don't want to write a book about how ugly it was. No. I mean, and it was probably more, we did, you know, we did. The advantage was technology. It was technology, and we did what we did when we went into the trees. We forced it, right? And we were successful, right? But I mean, I remember when we were at Team Five together. Like they wouldn't even give us desert camis because those all went to Team Three. Team Three, right? And so they wanted my green ones, and they I wanted their tan, and I was like, no, piss off! You can't have mine. I'm not <laughs> telling you anything. They didn't even go to Kodiak at Team Three. Not at all. But and then here we are in Afghanistan. Like, how can you have that on your uniform? Where'd you get that piece of gear? What do you guys call yourself? This isn't going to work. <laughs> I had a, a guy that ended up being an instructor for us. He's telling us a story. Uh, Team 3 guy going into Afghanistan. War still very young, probably not even a year old. And uh, they're in the back of a 47, and they're sitting there, and there's a pile of snowshoes. Because <laughs> they know they're going to get inserted at altitude yeah. in the snow. And they're, they're literally looking at it. I can't even tell you the gear they've got on because it's nothing appropriate. They've got some boots that aren't broken, et cetera. And probably, looking, probably jungle boots. And, and he's telling me, he says, I'm looking at this pile of snowshoes. And he goes, literally, I don't know how, I don't know how to put it on. Like, we've never had snowshoes on, but they know we needed them. But anyways, nobody put them on. Ramp comes down. They get out. Luckily, it wasn't hot. 
and they fall in the snow up to their waist and they're fucked right yeah you're not going anywhere so anyway so we needed to really get on it so i was just because of i'll just say unique skill sets that i had which before you go farther two things one i think it's important to note that the distance between seal team five and seal team three geographically at that time was probably a hundred yards yeah, you could throw a baseball you could throw a baseball and hit the two commands, one command trained a little bit in the winter environment, alpine environment. The other one didn't, but deployed to the same place. And then two, your, the reason that you were able to go to Alaska and do all the stuff that you did and pass those skills on is because you had a, a very robust skill set yourself. You actually took Jason and I on our first lead climbing trip ever to J Tree. Yeah, you said that, and it was interesting because I remember the trip, but yeah. I didn't. I mean, I remember you guys were there, but yeah. I just didn't... It was just the two of us. I just hadn't put it together. Yeah. yeah. I just... I did so many of them that... I remember you were teaching... And some of them are a, yeah. a blur because of tequila and et cetera. But. For whatever reason, I think we were drinking like Natty Light, which is in a yeah. tent. It like, God. And all I remember is I would wake up in the I've morning... I never drank Natty Light. <laughs> no, Jason and I were. <laughs> I remember waking up in the morning and looking at my hands and going... I don't want to touch these fingers to porous rock it's, anymore. I just it's like putting them on a belt sander for oh a day. Oh God! And then the first climb of the morning, you just touch your hand to the rock. You're like, oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> but I mean, so you, I mean, we have to go even farther back. You are a Navy diver that spent the vast majority of your career. I would say you know as much and spent as much time in the SEAL teams as I did. I, I like to say I was classically trained as yes. a Navy diver, and I did that job for six of my 26 years in the navy and then you were in the seal teams and then i was with worked with the seal teams for 20 years yep but so classically trained in navy diving we're talking the legitimate probably the hard hat stuff the yeah. depth you were talking yeah. uh last night at dinner about doing the diving tables tests and for people who don't understand how the military gets their diving tables and figures out how long <laughs> you can stay underwater what they do is they put people underwater for a really long time, and if and if you come up and you get bent and something goes wrong, they take five minutes off the table and put another person in the water. Next. Yeah. Yeah. And if he's okay, then they're like, well, you know what? We'll go to 10% safety margin, and that's where your dive table comes from. But none of that has anything to do with climbing either. So No. And at Team 5, when Jason and I checked in, we went on that trip, I think in 90... It would have been 97 or 8. It was 97. I was going to say 98 at the latest. Yeah, at the latest. You were already... I mean... Later on in my career, I was able to climb with Cosgrove and Gerberdine. Like, I was leading the Bastille crack with, uh, I think it was Gerberdine, right? He freaked me out. Have I ever told you about this? I was with uh, Jason. I don't want to say his last name because yeah. he's still active, but yeah. he was a Team 5 guy, too. Yeah. And I'm leading, We climbed a lot together, Jason. He's and awesome, yeah. yeah. And I was leading, like, the third pitch, and this is in by Boulder, right? That's I yeah. think where we flew into. And I was leading so i was above my own protection that i was setting at a subpar level so i was pretty <laughs> sure that if i had fallen i was going to take a zipper all the way down and i got to a point and if you rock climb you'll understand this point where you're kind of like stuck and you don't and I'm, my world is kind of shrunk in and i was like looking around and you know i had all my weight on my feet and i was i was relaxed but you know it was it was becoming an emotional event for a little bit and right next to me i hear gerberding go hey man and then he takes a drag off his cigarette. Which means he's hanging on by one hand. In tennis shoes. <laughs> in his approach shoes. And he taps a cigarette. He's like, hey, put, put something in right there. And I just, I turned my head away from him because I had caught out of the corner of the eye. Like, I'm scared out of my mind. <laughs> and this dude is in shorts, a t-shirt, and I think New Balance 850s. <laughs> 200 feet up, smoking a cigarette. And I just turned my head away from him. I was like, hey, man, I need you to get away from me because you're <laughs> freaking me out. He's like, all right, cool, and just scurried up the top. Wow. But, I mean, so I got to climb with all those, but it was based off some of the skills that you had taught us, like the aid climbing stuff. And I actually was a lead climber when I was on the East Coast the whole time with the magnets on the side of the ship, yeah, like all yeah. sorts of stuff. That Gerberdine trip was actually while I was at that command. Uh, but where did you get that knowledge? Because you said you grew up in Ohio, which I'm not – I don't think it's known for... Brother, it's just like my, my bow hunting is what I wanted to do, and I went and got it. I, uh, I was living in Virginia Beach um, is when I first got to, uh, it's called Debt Little Creek, but, mm -hmm. and we were teaching sub-ops, right? How to get guys in gear out of submarines underwater. Is this part of your classical training? No. This, this, was, the, this was my first command in, uh, with the SEAL teams. Okay. Um, so we were doing, you know, 
free ascents and going on sub trips and teaching guys how to get zodiacs and outboards. I mean, the MSLO, just, MSLI, just shit that they don't even do anymore. How to get yeah. out, in and out of uh, torpedo tubes and like the classic <laughs> like James Bond stuff. That I would say the torpedo tube. I've seen pictures of it and I've heard people talk about it. That's some legitimate frogman if, legacy stuff. Yeah. If there ever was, and if if you have. If you ever want to know if you're claustrophobic, yeah, get in a tube. Yeah, describe for me a torpedo tube lockout, if you would. So, a, so the first guy gets in feet first, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously this coffin is going to fill with water. So you have to take your rig off and you have to put it in front of you, and you're breathing. And so you shimmy in first, feet first, and then the next guy gets in head first. So that you're face to face. So when you die, you can make eye contact. Exactly, with each other. and if anything happens, you can buddy breathe, etc. And then um, it gets really, really dark and very quiet, and then it starts flooding. And once it floods, then the pressure inside the tube and the outside pressure uh, is equalized, and then they open up. And then the guy just, the guy that got in second just starts pushing the dude in the face. And uh, you just kind of pop out like a turd from a, from a submarine. Except you're coming out the front end. It's, you're coming out the front end. So, you know, that was like really old school. Then we started, then they had escape, escape trunks, you know. Yep. And um, then the dry decks. And then, it, and then actually when you got, and I never did that, but. There's actually submarines, as yep. you know, that are, yeah. So that all that eventually went, well, out here. Um, we did 20-plus uh, days on the Kamehameha mm. off of Guam on a pre-9-11 deployment, and uh -huh. all we did was MSLO, MSLI, which is Mass Swimmer Lock Out, Mass Swimmer Lock, lock In. in. Yep. And it's this huge, I don't know, garage bay. I mean, it's not, it's not as big as a garage. What does it look like? Hard to describe. Uh, like a 20-foot Connex box. A Connex box, which yeah. most people listening to this will nope, also have nope. no idea what yeah, that is either. I'm trying to think um, like a shipping container. A shipping container, and it's attached to the top of the submarine, and you crawl in there, and it's totally dry, and they have the regulators coming down, and they might have a mini-sub in there, and then they start, slowly start filling it up, and there's yeah. some chem lights that are cracked, and there's a guy standing in a chamber, a partially submerged chamber, who's writing stuff on a twisting knobs and dials that I have no idea what they do, and... <laughs> The thing floods and you sit there and like you said, they equalize the pressure and probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen though was uh, sunset at Guam. They were wanted to do a practice recovery where a couple of us swam to the surface and we would on a rubber band, we would launch a chem light into the air and they would see it with the periscope. The sub would come at us. As the sub was coming at us, we would dive down, get in front of it and basically just hover there as a sub passed and then we would scoop into the dry deck. That was one of the coolest things I've ever done. But... To do that, we obviously had to get out of the sub, and it was right at sunset. So they cracked the door, and you can see the the propeller slowly spinning oh, yeah. on the nuke sub. Yeah, and seven the, prop. Yep. And the sun was setting. Obviously, we were about 60 feet underwater, but just the angle mm. and the color. And then it's like, all right, <clears throat> cool, get out. <laughs> it, it's crazy, man. I mean, it's funny because, you know, I know you worked at second phase. Yep. And... Uh, which is a phase that in buds that teaches diving, and, and it's so funny because guys are like, "Oh, pool comp, pool comp," and it, and truly, I, I mean, I say because I, you know, basically I'd been in the water for twenty six years that, um, you know, water is a great equalizer. I mean, I've seen some of the toughest dudes just damn near lose it because of water, um, but in the grand scheme of things, just what you described, diving down sixty feet in the middle of the ocean to try to go inside a moving submarine, I mean pool comp is a joke <laughs> yeah right it was it's a joke compared to that well because it's controlled in that other environment there's so many other it's variables not controlled yeah um but you have to be able to do one to be able to do the other yeah which is why yeah. pool comp is so stressful and, <clears throat> and i i usually gave the the verbal brief of pool comp and i would get up there and walk them all through it and the things i used to always go back to were these are the procedures you have to follow i don't care how freaked out you are if you deviate from the procedure, you're going to fail, which may not make sense to you right now because this is an artificial test that we're doing to you. But people have died later on in their career because they deviated from procedures that were briefed to them. So you either need to accept the fact that the emotional aspect of the fear or the panic, which is largely what it was, right. that doesn't matter. You stick to your procedures and it will save your life 
later on. But couldn't you say the same thing, not the save your life part, but couldn't you say the same thing about bow hunting? Your shot process, like shooting a pistol, it, it always comes back to the basics, the mastery of the basics, right? And that yep. that conscious thought of working through so that you get over the target panic, buck fever, you know, fear of drowning, whatever the case may be. Um, Every high-level marksmanship instructor I ever worked with, I was always surprised by how many times they would go to the, the line, the shooting line, face a target, no ammunition in their gun, and just, here's, where, here's how I index my holster, here's where my magazine is. They would go through dry reload drills with no bullets in and just pull the weapon up and dry fire, dry fire, dry fire, and then they would go set some record-breaking time after doing all of right. that. You could shoot a million rounds, but I bet you those guys have shot five million not necessarily imaginary rounds, but they've pulled the trigger so many times without a round in the chamber. That's how they got as good as they are because they have such a mastery, mastery of the basics. But again, how did you get so good at rock climbing? <laughs> yeah, so I was living back there and uh, met a guy who had climbed and uh, I, we got connected through another guy. Anyways, the three of us ended up climbing and they were really experienced. And... Uh, I mean, it damn near cost me my marriage, to be honest with you, like real close. But I just, every weekend, I was going climbing. And going up then, to like New River Gorge area to climb? We went to New River Gorge. Um, and my wife, she's a, she's actually a good climber. You know, we, we would go climbing together. But uh, no, I, I had, uh, so the rock, the basic free climbing, you know, hands and feet. Mm. Um, that was good. But then we... Uh, then we started doing the aid climbing. We'd go to North Carolina, then then the Yosemite, Red Rock, starting to do big walls. Like so, aid, you I started to, going down a rabbit hole, dude. That you had to describe I, aid I'm, climbing. I'm too. pretty sure I was real close to not coming back from it. Like I was gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna say I was talented enough to be a Gerberdine, but yeah. But I was. I you're was gonna. gonna go I was up. gonna live out of my van down by the river. I was gonna yeah. say you're gonna invest in a Volkswagen. Yeah. So yeah. aid climbing for people who don't know what that is is. Oh, actually, you can describe it. Well, it's so it's you're using artificial means to scale essentially sheer cliffs. So, so you'd look at something and say, well, there's really no weakness. There's no handholds, footholds, any crack I could put, you know, traditional protection in. Um, but aid climbing has different gadgets that you can use. And, and really for, you know, that's what I, that's how I started people um, climbing is, is with aid climbing. I thought it was the more appropriate method for a military application because if you think about it and you know you can fly over get all the imagery you want but essentially anything you would do real world would be a first descent oh, absolutely. right which means it's the first time you've ever seen it you have no idea what it's rated all you have to do is be successful one so person has to be successful one person has to be successful so it's it's game on it's anything and everything i don't care if it's poles with hooks or magnets on a ship whatever it is you got to get it done and so there's you need a big bag of tricks and skills to be able to do that and uh you don't necessarily have to be the most fit rock climber but you have to be really mechanical and understand how it all works and so it's systems and ropes and it just gets really complicated we're talking things like <clears throat> like if you look down at your finger like your index finger and you see the gap between your nail and the actual skin we're talking like a Fifi hook tucked it. I mean, yeah. th that's that's the type of stuff that it is with a climbing. And then you have basically rope ladders that your feet are on, and you're moving one to the other. It's it's very intricate, and it's not what I would say quick. It can be if you can go from aid to trad climbing, and then back to aid. But yeah, I remember you teaching Jason and I that stuff as well too. And we yeah. we would take an hour to climb twenty feet because we were literally just trying to figure out how to get our protection place placed along the way. Right, but you got really good at placing protection, which is. Yep. Truly what you, so, you know, you mentioned Bastille crack and you're like, well, I don't even know if it's very good. Yeah. When you aid climb, you know, because every piece is holding at least your body weight. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, I took that about as far as I think I could with my body size, you know, 225. Um, we did a first ascent in Red Rock, me and a guy, um, we called it Thor's highway. And, uh, cause we used, a, I, I used a lot of my hammer yeah and uh but anyways i kind of i know what you're talking about when you had gerberding come up and uh two moves off 
the hanging belay cam blows out of an expanding flake, right? So I take a small fall, a couple feet, no big deal. Put the cam back, okay, I know that. Cast off, and I don't exactly remember now. I've got it all written down, but I think 12 or 13 hook moves. So that's just hooks. Yep. So, Small little just hooks that are suspending your entire body yep. weight. And you're trying, you know, you're trying to reach as high as you can to do as few as you can, but you also have to do them where it's available. And then a little uh, bird beak, which is just, it's, it's just purely for body weight. It would never hold my weight. <laughs> Anyways, and then right, and I'm sitting there, and I don't know if I've ever been more focused in my life because I'm like, fuck me, what am I doing, <laughs> right? And off to my right, because we're, we're, we're trying to force a route between a couple other routes, yep. right? And this dude is like 50 feet to my right, like free climbing some five eight fun thing and you know i've already been on the wall for a day and this dude's like hey man you look kind of tense and i swear to god like (laughs) if i wasn't afraid of pulling the hook out like i'd have fucking thrown something at him yeah but uh and then get to the very top of the pitch and the last move i have to slot like a really tiny nut or stopper right and then mantle onto this ledge and I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. So <laughs> that's when I started really pursuing um, the, uh, which probably no safer, but you know, alpine climbing, ice climbing. My wife's an incredible skier. So that's when we made the move from Virginia Beach when I met you. Yep. We made the move out to California. I wanted to go to a team, and I wanted to be on the West Coast. Um Purely for the climbing and skiing, to be honest with you. Yeah, the proximity to J Tree or yeah, all those places. And Yosemite and all yeah. that. And and every weekend, I mean, and again, I, I just met people that were guides and they were more than willing to share their time and take me out and let me screw up and teach me. And uh, I amassed a, a really good amount of, of experience in a short amount of time. Um, so, anyways, that kind of set me up for. So here, so I'll, I'll give you one more story. So, um, one of the platoons. This is how it all started. Uh, one of the platoons was supposed to go to Kodiak, and something happened. Flights or whatever, something fell through. And uh, so the platoon chief Chip, he comes to me and he says, "Hey man, uh, a, a buddy of mine at the time, Jared, it told the guy Chip. He says, "Hey, I, th- I think John can do it." Well, I'd been up skiing in the uh, San Gregonio Wilderness, uh, which is near Big Bear. Okay. I'd been going up there and doing a bunch of backcountry stuff, and just, it's awesome. We should go there sometime. But uh, so anyways, he's like, hey, man, I I think John could do it. So anyways, I ended up running this cold weather trip for this platoon. And that really, Chip, again, this guy Chip, like he gave me my start. We still talk to each other. Anyways, I ended up in Kodiak, and then once I was in Kodiak, um, we just turned the burners to it, spent a year doing nothing but basically working ourselves up, went to all the American Avalanche classes, yeah, um, most of the Canadian courses. Um, just you know, every outdoor <coughs> wilderness, sur- yep. I wouldn't say necessarily survival, but let's say educational school that yep. enhances your survival rate. And, and, and the great thing about the teams is, like they'll spend the money to bring the experts in. So, you know, I was able to learn from Mark, our friend Mark. Yep. Incredible guy, like some of the best, you know, survival instructors in the world. He knows a thing or two. He does know a (laughs) thing or two. Yeah. Well, and his attitude was just, it's perfect for the community, special operations, right? Because he, he thinks that way. He thinks very unconventional. Yep. Um, so yeah. So anyways, whatever, I spent 15 years up there and, and so you have to explain, uh, or I'll explain how people get there. So if you want to be a SEAL, you obviously go to boot camp where you learn how to fold underwear and T-shirts oddly in March. I would say that's what I got out of Navy boot camp. Pretty much. I yeah. still fold my T-shirts the same way. I think it freaks Jamie out. Uh, many, I, don't, I don't fold T-shirts anymore. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> or underwear. <laughs> you go to your occupation. Well, at least when I went through, you went to an occupational school. Now, Buds is an occupational school in and of itself. Yeah, that's right. If you graduate that, you're not a SEAL. You have to continue on a training pipeline. And isn't the first thing they do, actually, Kodiak? Uh, it, or or it, do they do jumping first? It. 
it it changes all the time. At one point, we were the last part of it, um, and at one point, we were the very first part of it. It's I, it's a bit much, honestly. Yeah, for a guy to come out of buds and go right to Kodiak. I mean, it's the first time they've traveled. They got to decompress a little bit too. It's not a great place to jump into for a month because day one. I mean, we're hammering on them from day one. Well, and I think the point is is that pre nine eleven, like at Team Five. We, the platoons, would go there because Team 5 was tasked with Southwest Asia. Right. In cold weather environments. Team 3 would not go there. Shortly after 9-11, they realized that we have to get rid of this geographic specificity and everybody needs to go training. So instead of being a place that that took platoons part and parcel, it became actually part of the pipeline. So you would get every single student, whether they were going to the West Coast or the East Coast, and they would all go through the training that you put them through and have that cold weather skill set. Right. I I, yeah. I call it the basics. I mean, again, it changed over the years, but 30 days up there, and they were probably in the field 25 of those. Yeah, so what did you guys teach? I mean, walk me through the students show up there. Again, they're not SEALs. They're learning. They're in their... They're in the learning phase, and they're getting close to that point where they're going to achieve that goal, but they're not there yet. And I think actually the stuff that you taught up there is what I would, when I was telling you we should sit down and do a podcast, that's the most interesting stuff to me, the survival aspect and the things that you were teaching. So what? talk to me about the curriculum at a broad level. Yeah, so, you know, if somebody asked me, oh, what'd you do? I really don't know what to tell them. Um and and I over the years I've I've kind of gotten to the part where I say well I was a survival instructor right um, and that's not necessarily tells the whole story then I'd say well I taught you know mountain warfare well that doesn't really tell the whole story so I, I don't really know so we'll just call it survival right but my definition of survival is probably not the classic definition of survival um, what we tried to do in thirty days is allow guys to go into an incredibly dangerous, uncompromising environment, very dynamic weather, um, and be able to live and survive and do their job. And uh, I like to say that, you know, at the end of the 30 days, my goal was to allow them to go into a field, into the field on a real world op, um, and leave on their terms and not the mountain's terms. And that's because that's the job. I mean, you're not, and, and you know, our friend Mark, like he tell you, he goes, because we would go on more advanced trips together. And he's like, man, he goes, I didn't realize it, but you know, when I'm alpine climbing, I go when the conditions are perfect. And yeah. if they change, I leave. And if I drop something and it's not working, I, I go home. You know, he goes, you guys can't do that. And I said, no, like these guys have never seen the terrain. There's no guidebook for it, right? I mean, obviously there's intel, et cetera. Yeah. But, and if the shit goes south, you're not coming out. Yeah, you're still going. <laughs> you, yeah, and we would go out and, I mean, my God, the weather we went out in. Like, just, it was savage, you know? But it taught guys that if, again, if they understood the basics of clothing, of hydration, of nutrition, um, all these different things, right? Not, I mean, we, we got into the fire and all this kind of shelters, all these kind of things, right? Um, that it gave them the confidence to go, yep, I can go. I can go out there. And if shit goes south, if I've got these couple things, like, I can do this. You can audible and get the job done for I, sure. I, I can do this. And it was cool because we would teach the, the basic course. And then eventually, you know, platoons, once the war started evolving, platoons would say, hey, we need... We'd like to do more advanced stuff. And, um, you know, of course, you're seeing a lot of the former students. Mm -hmm. And so you you knew what they were taught, and you knew, you know, you'd do a quick refresher, and then you could begin to build upon that. And uh, so it was really, it was really cool. But, but you know, my, that's my definition of survival. It's like, well, what about making a, a bird trap or a basket? And I'm like, well, f I, they don't need to know that. I mean, I could teach them that, yeah. but that's primitive living. That's like, more for somebody not, yeah, wants to go get off the grid. and We're not filming know. a TV show here. Like yeah. This is like no shit. And uh, so, you know, I've done a couple things 
uh, working with Sitka gear, like basically it, it, it was plug and play for me. I mean, everything I had learned about clothing systems and layering, yep. et cetera, right? I just, I'm like... Probably even camo. Right. Absolutely. Camo with uh, the PSM uh, program, but uh, personal signature management. But um, but it was just plug and play for me because what I was learning and what I was teaching, I was then applying to my own hunting. I told you, I said, you know, I basically hunted for 15 years by myself. Part of it was because I just... Every time I'd go out in the mountains, I'd have, you know, between 12 and 50 of my favorite friends out there, right? <laughs> these, these students and my buddies. And it's like, I need to get away, go out by yeah. myself, do my thing. But I would, I would practice. I would try things. I would come back and apply those lessons, right? Um, so getting the Sitka, it was like, well, this is, it's the same stuff. It's just, you know, a little bit different. It's a different application is all it is. You're shooting different things yeah. and, you know, you're, but... But for the most part, it's it's similar, broad broad, broad brush. It's similar. Um, but so I did this thing where I jumped in the frozen river, you know, and, and yeah, got, you got out. You got to tell about the or talk about the rewarming drill because I think it got enhanced and evolved since when I did it. No, it definitely did. So it just used to be a <laughs> kick in the nuts, right? Where guys would come up to Kodiak, it'd be like, all right, strip down to your boxers, go jump in the freezing, frigid, raging, you know. We got into, we woke up one morning and we, you know, there was a whiteboard there and we had bre- breakfast and the gear list literally said running shorts and tennis shoes. And we got into a military like 15 pack van and we drove <laughs> along until there was a section of beach that was accessible and they're like, okay, ghost, you have to completely submerge yourself and then you can have your neck, you know, you need to be basically at your chin in the water for five minutes and I'm like, okay. So we went out there and it sucked. The worst part though was by far the rewarming process and the burning and the tingling and yep, all of that. Yep. But we went out there and we dunked our head and you sit there and the five minute clock comes up and then we got into the van and drove back and we went into a hot tub and I think we drank beer for the rest of the day and it was a kick in the balls versus, you know, because I know that the, you were talking about the layering system and the understanding of that. That plays into the rewarming drill as well. So maybe you could explain what you guys do now and actually teach. Well, it's critical. That. You have to have an entire kit, right? So, <laughs> um, I mean, the reality is once a guy becomes a SEAL, like, I think he's proven that he can deal with cold water. So to just make somebody get sometimes, cold again. Sometimes. I mean, we're all a little hydrophobic, but <laughs> it, like, it, it's worthless. Like, there's no training value in that. And so... Over the course of probably two years, we were able to work with these, you know, incredible outdoor companies, right? Some of the finest out there, um, developing clothing, backpacks, sleeping bags, tents, etc. So now we had a system. We had a basic kit now that we could train to, and so we we had to add training. We we thought there was value, but we needed to to, to put it in there. So what we do is there was one part of the training we go on a four day patrol. And, Which is basically, uh, think, walking around. Yeah, so, civilian, yeah, they'd call it hiking. We yep. went on a four-day hike. That's what we did uh, with guns. And, uh, you know, tried to, we, we teach them how to use a terrain to their advantage. Which is interesting. Um, you know, you've gotten into snowboarding. Yep. Make sure I get back to this point, because I might go down the road here. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> What's part, the snowboarding or the hiking? The hiking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but, you know, you've gotten into to snowboarding, but you got a split board. You're getting into backcountry yes. stuff. And so it's real interesting because as a civilian, right, we're going out there and we want to make sure we're safe and we do certain things and we wear beacons, you know, avalanche beacons. So if somebody gets buried, we can yep. find them. We have the, the basic tools to do that, et cetera. And again, we go when the weather's good. We go in places that are safe. Yep. We avoid certain terrain features and it's almost like, it's almost like archery hunting in bear country. When you are a military person doing a patrol in the mountains, you almost do everything wrong <laughs> or everything uh, that's dangerous because you need to exploit the terrain to your advantage. You're worried about cover and concealment. You need to move in low areas. You need to move at night. Um, you may need to move over convex surfaces, etc. You probably, in a real world op, you're not wearing a beacon. Because you don't want to be DF'd, 
right? Like you're doing all this stupid stuff, but you need to teach them that. So we would go out and, uh, you know, and teach them how to do that and how to avoid certain areas, what to look for, et cetera. So anyways, we go on this hike in the winter. And uh, at the end of that, you're teaching guys, hey, always have water on you. Make sure you pack. You know, when you pack up your, your, you know, your LUP, your camp, like make sure that... LUP is layup point. Yep. So, sorry. <laughs> uh, but when you do that, make sure that you are ready... Like you are always ready. So to your point of folding your T-shirt and your in your in your uh, underwear, right? It's basically the same lessons. Yeah. Um, make sure your shit's together. And so at the end, they'd come down after four days. They can you know see the trucks. They're they're smelling the barn, etc. And it's like, stop, boys. We ain't done yet. <laughs> yes. And uh, time for some negative reinforcement. Some negative reinforcement. There's a classic <laughs> picture of a guy. One of our instructors standing on a rock with his hands in his pockets, just as calm and warm as can be. And these poor bastards are in water up to their neck, wearing their clothes, because we have a training system, or a clothing system to train to, yep. right? And what you, Which is the reality, because you're not going to go fall in the water in running shorts in the wintertime. You're not going to do that. Um, and what you don't know is prior to that pick, because there was ice on the lake that day, and it's kind of like telling a guy to dig his own grave is we gave them a couple of axes and said three or four of you go out there and chop a hole in the ice so that you can <laughs> jump in it because they thought for sure they were out of it they're like oh no there's no water to jump in it's like no at that point i think you could probably audibly hear the motivation just Dude, suck and they've already you know they've lived in snow caves they've yep. gotten their balls kicked in for four days which you is know, not a, which is not the four seasons which we were lucky it is to not the four here. seasons you can but, survive in a snow cave you're not thriving in a snow cave yeah well potentially you can but uh if you make the hilton of snow caves well, yes. hopefully we find that out next year but yeah. but uh you know so you really you really test a guy and reinforce lessons like listen you know and i don't know if it happened to you but how many times you're going out for 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, and all of a sudden you get retasked, and you either don't come back or you come back, load up again and go, or you get reinserted somewhere else. Like, like you don't know. There's no... Yep. Th th so you have to teach these guys what it is. And so anyways, they would get in the water um, with their clothes. They'd get out. We'd leave them for a pretty long period of time, but we knew all the... Just like you guys in second phase, we knew how long we could leave them, yep. et cetera. Um, and then they would get out and we would teach them, uh, uh, again, a process, right? Something to think about. So don't freak out. What is your number one priority? What is your number two priority? What is your number three priority? And uh, so anyways, we would teach them that. So I did it because I think, you know, the hunting industry, I, you know, nobody talks about this. Everybody wants to be a backcountry badass, I call them. Um, and there's no Superman's cape, right? So like, I think we make awesome product. Like I literally would trust my life to it. Um, but you have to know how to use it. Yeah. You know, so your son's what, 14? Yep. And you're going to teach him to drive? Yeah. And so he jumps in the Ferrari you give him. I used this analogy the other night. And he gets it in, he, you know, grinds it into second gear and he's going, you know, 40 miles an hour. And he thinks it's the best thing ever. But the reality is, you know that there's six speeds and you yeah. go 200, <laughs> right? And yeah. so once he knows there's six speeds and go 200, you're like, damn, this is like really worth it. So anyways, I just took the lessons from the military. I'd already applied them in my own life to my hunting. And I'm trying to teach the hunting industry like what it really is. Because most guys will say, I was looking at something today online. Some guy did a video and I won't comment on it. But um, guys are like, well, that was the dumbest thing ever. Like you, you get dunked in a river. Like why would you not just jump out and make a fire? And I'm like, I'm like, fine. <laughs> I'm like, I will, I, I said, and I can't say this, right? Yeah. But it, it, I'll just be fair. That's not a smart thing to do. And the reason I can say that is because I've been there and done that. And so if you can tell me I'm prepared, I have several ways to make a fire. They're all waterproof. And I've done it in six inches of slushy snow. I was going to say, and you have a fuel source. Or, you know, in the rain. Or because you have, if you're cold and wet, 
you only have a certain amount of minutes and I can't tell you exactly, you know, but it's not long, maybe no more than 10. Before you begin to lose fine motor function and you have nothing but gross motor function. So you know how they teach you to rack yep. up. Tap rack, rack bang. Exactly. Gross motor skills, right? In the heat of the moment. Um, same thing. So it's like, Am I going to spend 10 minutes trying to start a fire that the reality is if the fire is as big around as a, as a saucer is not going to provide any heat. So I'm just going to die looking at that. You're going to freeze to death looking at flames. Or am I going to go through my priorities, get warm, get out of the elements. At some point, once my shit is figured out, now I'll start a fire, right? And so... Um, that's what we taught the guys, and uh, so that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm trying to, at some point, kind of beat the drum and and get backcountry hunters, because there's a lot, there's more people going to the backcountry than ever, and uh, yeah, they need they need to be prepared, they need to train, how they need people, to think through it. How many people per year in the backcountry do you think get stuck in a or caught in a survival situation? I mean, it's, it's probably that's, I mean, that's a wild ass guess for sure. But what would your what would your guess be? It is, and I I, I don't know, but I would tell you that my guess is they're not talking about it on Instagram. I would agree. So, <laughs> um, l- l- so I did a podcast with uh, Brian Call and Gritty Bowman, who is a Bowman, but he's not gritty. <laughs> There's no dirt under his fingernails. <laughs> He had a manicured beard. It's like that. You're not a gritty bowman. You're a bowman. Damn it! I love the guy. He's awesome. His definition of gritty is interesting. Yeah. Um, well, did you see him? He's sitting down. He's doing sitting down doing seated, seated box jumps. Like the dude's strong. Like, why would Why would you do that? I, I, I don't know. Because he's struck, got strong legs and he wants to exercise him. And it made a great, great post. <laughs> Super great post. Like I was like, God damn, dude. He's like yeah. jumping on top of my head from a seated position, but Good um, repeatedly. But uh, but so him and Aaron Snyder were hunting elk at twelve thousand feet, twelve five in Colorado. You know, and Aaron's a, a ranger, ex ranger, mm-hmm. and uh, they're wearing our gear. And storm rolls over the top, as so often does, especially in the high country. Quickly, quickly, and uh, it was dusk, anyways, and so. Aaron decides, I'm just hauling ass to the tent. I'm not going to stop and put anything on. <laughs> Brian says, I'm going to haul ass to the tent, but I'm going to put a rain jacket on. Well, by the time they get to the tent, and, and then they, we talk, he talks about this on, on the podcast, and I don't know which number that is, but um, the, you know, they, almost, they almost don't find their tents, yep. which is, you know, that's a whole other topic of conversation. That's happened to me a couple times. Um, so they almost don't find their, their shelter, but they do because they're, they're smart. They're thinking through it. They're staying clear. They have a process. They get inside. What do they do? Right? So they think about it. They're like, well, we'll jump in our sleeping bags. So they jump in their sleeping bags and then they're like, well, this kind of sucks. Like (laughs) my balls are kind of steamy and you know, (laughs) my armpits are kind of moist and I don't know if this is like the best thing ever. And, uh, so they're like, and he, and he tells me, he's like, they're consciously talking about this. And, and I'm not throwing them under the bus, yeah. but it, this is a great example because these are really experienced dudes. So they take all their stuff off and I'm probably, you know, summarizing here and they throw their stuff in the corner of the tent and they put on some dry base layers, which I never, I never bring extra clothing ever because I, I don't need to. Yeah. And, uh, and they get in their sleeping bags and they go to sleep. And they wake up the next morning, and they're at twelve five in Colorado. And, and I said, frozen. And I said, what was the temperature? And he goes, below freezing, because our stuff was frozen. Yeah. And so now, they had to go and put it back on, right? And then figure it out during the day and dry their stuff out. Or you spend an entire, if the weather's good, yep. you spend the next great day that you'd rather be hunting, drying their stuff out, right? So, I don't know, but Brian was you know gracious enough to share that story, but it's like, Dude, these are experienced guys, and this is happening. Like well, guys that are inexperienced. Those are experienced hunters. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily experienced in understanding what they need to do in a survival situation. I think there's a. I think there's a clear delineation. I, I between think they those two. did. I think they just they knew what to do. They just decided to do something else. Obviously, right? they need to take their clothes off and get in the same <laughs> sleeping bag. 
<laughs> That's where I thought that story was going. I've got a story about that too, but I won't go there. <laughs> so tell people what would have been the correct approach. So assuming you've thought through the entire system, everything from socks and underwear to the sleeping bag in the tent, the best thing to do is once you found the tent, to get there, take the rain gear off. Assuming you, um, you know, had a shelter and all that, get inside, get in the sleeping bag, wet. You could potentially wring your stuff out once you're in the shelter. That's appropriate, right? As long as you're not like on the verge of hypothermia, mm -hmm. you don't have to rush necessarily, but sometimes you do, and that's what I demonstrated in that video. Um, and get in the sleeping bag with your clothes on. Now, the sleeping bag's got to be synthetic. I've, I've tried, I've, I've tested treated down products. They've, they've got severe limitations that, that people don't talk about, compressibility being one of them with moisture. Um, and you sit there and you start your stove and you boil a hot cup of coffee, tea, uh, apple cider, whatever. Irish coffee, whatever it may be. I was, yeah, a little <laughs> bourbon. And uh, so you get some hot liquids in you. So your your body, right, you're 98.6. Your body is the engine that will dry out your clothing. Which and is where so, the hot liquid comes in because you're, you're creating that, stoking the fire from the inside. Yeah, out. correct. So exactly the same analogy. You're throwing a log on the fire. Yep. You throw the log on the fire, you start with the drink, it's super easy, your body assimilates it you know, pretty good, especially if there's sugar in it, jacks your metabolism, everything's going good. Now, go ahead and eat a meal, whatever your meal may be. If you want, eat a candy bar, something like that, while the meal's getting ready to be prepped. Body warms up, you're in the bag. Assuming you have a proper layering system, it will. your body will literally cook the system dry from the inside out. It, it'll probably take... You know, depending, there's a lot of, you know, what's the humidity, temperature, et cetera. A couple hours, right? You might need to roll over, lay on your front so your ass dries out. You know, there's a few little things. Um, but I wake up eight hours later, my shit's dry, I'm ready to hunt. Yeah. The only thing I bring extra, because it's so super important, is socks. I normally bring a pair of socks for every two days. So let's look at that same scenario, but you can't find your shelter. Yeah. So what's your thought process? So that's then? when you need to know what your priorities are. So in that case, if you didn't put your rain gear on, you better put it on now. Yep. So that's going to stop uh, convective heat loss, right? And so it's important to know all this stuff. Like, what is convective heat loss? You know, how do I stop it? What causes it? All this kind of stuff. So. Convective heat loss is when stripping heat away from your body. Essentially, what you're saying is you need to do your due diligence before you go into the field. You, That's need, to how be a, you need to be a student of your craft. Correct. And like, and one point I wanted to bring up too, like you, you've said it, I hope people catch it, is you have to think through your entire system. If you have a great layering system but a sleeping bag that wouldn't work in that environment, you're fucked. That, and that's the point. So it can't be it can't be part and parcel. And all of those. It doesn't matter unless you find yourself in that situation, but if you find yourself in that situation, it could be the difference between hopefully not life and death, but being comfortable and you know sacrificing 48 hours, maybe you only have 72 hours to hunt. The rest of your time is going to be spent trying to warm yourself up and getting yourself back to that position where you can go out again. Yeah. I mean, if you have a great tag at a minimum, it could cost you that, that hunt. Um, and potentially it could cost you your life. It could cost you a couple digits. Like, don't you owe it to yourself, let alone your family, to, to like, you know, exer I like to say exercise your system, yeah. right? So that's maybe a way that people understand it on, you know. Or if you want to look like a genius in a crisis situation, think about that crisis situation before it actually occurs and think through what you're going to do. Because I have been in, on both sides of that coin where something happens and I, for two days before, I'm like, hey, if this happens, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and we're going to be fine. And then I've also been the asshole that's been there, and something happens, and I go, okay, how am I going to get myself out of this? And the difference in results in yeah. those two things, they might end up in the same place, but they take a different trajectory. Yeah. It's not always parallel to get to the same location. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so rain gear's on. You can't find your shelter. Yeah, so I'm going to... 
provide whatever shelter I can. So that first first layer, first line of defense, what clothing do I have? So if I don't have it on, I'm putting rain gear on. Next thing I'm trying to do is get out of the elements. So where can I find a place to seek refuge, right? So we've talked, you know, tree wells yep. or the lee side of a mountain or a rock or, you know, can I... Can I like I, do the I, tree well one. Let's go with that. Do, do I have a tarp, you know? Can, yep. I, can I shrink something up real quick? But it's going to depend, like, you, you'll know, like... I got 10 minutes to figure this out before I'm kind of screwed here or I have like 30 minutes but nonetheless you need to figure it out quick do that first now kind of reassess your situation what do I have is it daytime is it nighttime like how far away from the truck am I do I have a GPS does I get reception whatever the case may be do I go for it the, the worst thing you can do is panic, right? And the panic comes in really because you're ill-prepared. Yeah. So then if you're going to ride it out, you probably do want to start a fire at that point. But again, that uh, there's so many factors like... I have a good fire story. I don't want to interrupt like, you. Like I can't even... Like I can't even... I have a good I, Kodiak. I guess that's why we're doing the podcast, but... I have a good Kodiak fire story. Oh, ready okay. for it. No, I, I am. Right. But, you know, do you have the right materials to start it? Do you have the knowledge? Um, you know, do you have a knife? And, and then there's all these things. Like, you don't make it round. You make it long. You don't have to cut wood. It heats a couple people. Like, you know, but you've already got the shelter in That's place. That's a big one right there. Instead oh, of making dude, a round fire, make it dude, lengthwise. There's so, many, there's so many factors that people just... Because they know, they've read it in Outdoor Life, and it makes sense to them, and they've started it in, uh, you know, so let's say they started a fire, they didn't burn down the state, but they started a fire in Southern California in their backyard, yep. and they're like, oh, this shit's easy. Like, it's super easy. Well, of course it is, because there's no relative, relative humidity. And, and you're in a drought. And the wood's already been split, and yep. I've got my cotton ball with Vaseline or whatever the hell they got. And it's like, no, that's not, that's Correct. not reality. So, um, you know, jump back to Kodiak. So we did a thing during, we had a five day survival block. We taught basically the survival portion. When I, a couple of years before I left, we ended up teaching the survival portion of SEER, which is, go ahead. Survival, escape, resistance, and evasion. Right. Um, we taught the survival portion of that. And uh, so anyways, at the very end, so they didn't eat for three days. Out of the five, two days were classroom, I think, something like that. Three days in the field. And, you know, of course, like six hours into it, these dudes are starving. But the, but they're not. You can yeah. go, you know, three hours without shelter. I think you mean they feel hungry. Yeah. Three hours <laughs> without shelter, three days without water, three weeks yeah. without food, right? It's basically because you have so much internal fat on your body, you can deal with it. But um, so anyways, at the very end, it's like, all right, boys, here's a deal. And I forget right now an hour or whatever the case may be like to go gather materials so they go gather materials and it doesn't matter i mean it could be raining it could be monsoonal rains it could be six inches of slush underground doesn't matter anyways they go gather materials and it's like all right you have 15 minutes to start a fire and get a quart or a liter of water boiling and if you do Give you a mountain house and you get to eat. There will be a reward. And if not, <laughs> you, you don't not get, get to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I'll tell you what, man. Reinforcement. And, you know, you let you definitely let guys figure it out and struggle. Yeah. Um, but at a certain point, you want to teach them too. And so, you know, there's so many things. You know, the preparation of the materials. Like, you have to get the right wood. You yeah. have to know how to take a knife and get to the dry wood when it's in a wet environment. You need to site prep. Like if you throw it down on a sheet of ice, part of the fire triangle is heat. If you don't have heat because the ice is sucking the heat out of the fire, you're going like, nowhere. You're going nowhere. Yeah. Um, You'll be residents of the town that you and I were in for five of six days. <laughs> Fucksville? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you what, man, but the, just that, say, hour and a half of learning in, a, in an environment where, you know, after three days, they really want to eat. Yeah. It teaches them something. And I don't think they forget it. And um, and then once you they get to experience it for, well, you don't have to experience it, but if you want it to sink in, 
and be a lesson that that will stay with you probably for the rest of your life, I would say you have to experience it. Yeah. And I'm not saying everybody should go starve themselves for three days to start a fire. But what I'm saying is don't do it. If you live in Arizona, don't start a fire in your backyard and go, yep, I'm ready for the doll sheep hunt in, you know, the Northwest Territories because you're not like you're just not. So don't kid yourself and then be surprised when, you know, shit goes south and you're not ready. Like prepare, learn, like do everything you can and stuff's still going to go sideways, but you're far better off um, at that point than if you hadn't thought it through. Agreed. So, so, so tell me your fire story. All right. So first a question, though, because I want to see if you guys still teach the same thing. So if you get your tent going, do you guys ever teach them to fire up their whisper light stove or whatever it is to create warmth inside of the tent? Um, I can never condone that. Okay. But you, but yes. Because that's and where we, this story starts. And, and we don't use whisper lights anymore because I think I know where your story's going. No, oh, yeah. Uh, we use a canister stove. Yeah. The, the MSR reactor is one of the best stoves on the market. But it's the same one that I use. But but nonetheless, because it won't do what I think you're going to describe. So you have it to does. prime it, right? Yes. So the whisper light. Into I mean, with a cup. Into yep. a cup or it needs to be on a shovel as well. Something inside of your Shovel's tent. Shovel's good. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, this was my first trip up there. I was with DQ. We were yeah. traipsing around, whatever it was. I remember he rolled his ankle and my back hurt carrying him around as well too. <laughs> Which is saying a lot. It is. And so we, Love had, you, DQ. we had all gotten together, pitched our tents. I think I was going out to get some snow because DQ and I were at Masters of, we'd have our tent up. The rain fly was open. It was like 70 in there. We'd be in shorts. And I, I think he actually had a little travel thermometer. We would yell out, we're at 72. It's a competition. <laughs> what we were doing right. is we were using our food stove to heat up the tent. You guys had probably big tents, like big North Face we tents. We totally or did. It yeah. was, this, was, this is 98. At, yeah, you know so what before I mean? we yeah. were, were in it, yeah. So we were carrying the, you know, the white gas canisters. Yeah. You had yeah. to prime these stoves. You had to fill the bowl up, light it. On the shovel in case it fell over. So I was out at the fly getting my, uh, I think they were Scarpas. They were like a hard yep. boot. Yep. And I'm putting them on, and it's it's sundown. And I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. But the next thing I see is like the <laughs> glowing sun next to me. <laughs> Literally, it was as bright as the glowing sun. <laughs> and I look over, and all I can see is the pole outlines inside of the tent. And it's just... It, it looks like I'm staring into the sun, and then it starts shaking. The tent starts shaking, and a zipper comes open. <laughs> and a sleeping bag that's on fire <laughs> comes flying out of the tent. <laughs> and then another guy in the platoon dives out of the tent head first because they had started the fire on the, on the shovel in the whisper light. They had tipped it over, yeah. and the fluid gas had gone on the <laughs> sleeping bag, and it burned a massive hole in the side of the tent. So I, wa- I wanted to help them I from the bottom of my heart that I did, but I was paralyzed because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> so I couldn't render any assistance because I literally I, I couldn't see straight. The tears were coming out of my eyes. And they slept the rest of the night with a massive hole in their tent and yeah. a charred sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I unfortunately have seen that several times. We don't. We, so you know, the whisper lights an incredible stove. White gas stoves definitely have their place. But um, there's when we more did, steps than we, just clicking the buttons. Yeah, when we did the rewarming, I mean, you're doing some dangerous things on a lot of levels. Um, but you're trying to survive too, right? And again, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. But uh, I've seen that a few times. I won't mention the guy's name, but. Uh, I'm going around checking guys one night, and it's a Team Five platoon, and uh, I see the you know the orange glow from the from the from the tent. You can't miss it. And I I unzip I unzip the vestibule so they know I'm coming. I unzip the tent, and there's two dudes <laughs> sitting there on top of their sleeping bags. With no shirts on in their underwear, just chilling like it's a sauna, and I'm like, "What the hell?" You like, can get intent to like. In I the know, 80s. but yeah. how, dude? How much fuel do you have to carry when you're like? I did. I'm trying to think now. I, I hope I don't butcher this, but so I did a, a seven day doll sheep hunt 
in the Brooks Range, so north of the Arctic Circle. Um, and I went in by myself, and I took I took two four ounce canisters, and I think I'm pretty sure I got it written down somewhere, but I'm pretty sure that I got seven days out of one four ounce canister. Wow! Because I'm like I have a routine, like I am, <laughs> like I do this at this time. I mean, I try to, right? Yeah. Like, it's daylight 24 hours a day up there. If you don't discipline yourself, like, yeah. it's a shit show, I think. So, but anyways, four ounces, because I didn't want to carry a lot of weight. If I'm carrying white gas, and I'm using it to heat my tent up at night, like, liquid weighs a lot. Yeah. Was it so, seven, seven pounds a gallon, something like something that? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And I think it depends on the medium, but, yeah. So, hilarious, though. Hilarious. Like, that's, like... That's kind of like the Cold War stuff. Like some, so we don't do that anymore. Like we, we kind of got away from that. But the, the the stories were sure funny. They didn't think it was funny when they had the draft. Uh, no, I'm sure they. I'm nighttime. sure they didn't. Yeah. I I was. I think I snickered myself to sleep. <laughs> DQ and I laughed about that for a. Was it know, his tent? Not. I was in the tent with DQ. Oh, oh I got you. Okay. Yeah, I think I was like an E three, and he was an LT at the time. And yeah, it was his OIC platoon, but. That uh, that trip up there, I mean, we had some interesting experiences. We were we were that's the first time I actually ever got on a snowboard. I think mm. I was wearing my scarpas. Probably uh, up on Pyramid Mount, I'm sure. No, it was. Yeah. And it was on ice. And yeah. this guy's like, Hey, try this on. I immediately got turned around backwards, caught my rear edge and knocked myself out. Yep. Uh, took the board off and just pushed it down the hill. And that's why I waited another twenty some years before trying one again, because I was like, No, I don't want to do that. We were doing a patrol along, and we were on a, I don't know what it was, but it, the whole thing settled about a foot. It sounded like a shotgun going off. Yep. And everybody slowly reached back to turn on their avalanche beacons. Yep. <laughs> yep, that settling is unsettling. Yeah. Snowshoeing, though, skinning. I mean, that, that was a great, unbelievable trip. And then, yeah, never I'd, in the military, I never used a single one of those skill sets. I used the climbing stuff quite a bit. I never yeah. had a chance to use any of the... Never spent a night in a tent. That well, I you guys had a really back. robust climbing program where you were. We, yeah. I, I know that guy's a good friend of mine. Yeah, that runs that. Department. And we had a pretty, we had a pretty tight uh, window of how long we were going to operate. But yeah, I never even took a tent into the field. It was pretty, yeah, no, it's there's certain conditions um, where you can. And we we actually got away from multi man tents and started teaching really small one man tents. Yeah, um, almost survival and like an air quote. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons is because every person has to do it for themselves. Yeah. Because um, you know the group dynamic, right? The, the strong help the weak because everybody wants to get through the training, et cetera. You know, I mean, at a certain point. And uh, yeah, no, learning to backcountry ski or snowboard in Kodiak is, is kind of like hunting Axis deer on no wind days. <laughs> Like it's it's a it's graduate level stuff. Well, I only tried it for about fifteen seconds. So yeah, no, it can be <laughs> it can be rough for sure. Yeah, it was very rough. Jason and I, I forget what we made a Ziploc baggie full of gorp, which is basically cheese and sausage, uh-huh. and took our ice axes and crampons. I think it was the first time I ever tried to walk, and I'm completely shredded my outer layer <laughs> with the crampons. Self arrested multiple times, and uh, yeah, we climbed that mountain. That was you could overlook the airport down into the base. Yep. Uh, what the hell's the name of that? Yeah. Yeah, but that, I mean that was a hell of a trip, man. And it, uh, I mean, it, <clears throat> I heard people all the time talking about, you know, the key to survival is the headspace, and I think that's part of it, like the the will to just keep going and survive. My personal opinion, I don't know if you would agree, and I think I alluded to it earlier, is, is it comes to I think that a lot of it is the research before you put yourself into that situation and thinking through the what ifs. I have found that those are the things that make the biggest difference. Like, if everything's going great, like you're in your backyard, like you said, oh, I can make a fire, sure, but what if? What if it's wet? What if you don't have a lighter? Then what are you going to do? It's those what ifs that'll eat your lunch. So if you could, I mean, where would you start people off for the headspace when it comes to, where would you start the students off? I'm sure you guys gave them an in-brief in Alaska. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, this is is what we're going to be doing. Would you kind of explain to them where they need to be mentally going into those type of situations? Well, in training, you have to be – so, you know, you have so many diverse backgrounds that are coming in there, right? Some guys have taken Knowles courses. Some guys, you know, went to the Naval Academy and did some stuff during the summer. 
Um, you, you basically start from ground zero, um, but you have to be you have to be open to learn it too. So, yeah. and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Like, you know, I, I said, well, I watched this video today. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I, I need to be open-minded to it because 15 years I did this, I learned something every, almost every day I was out in the field. Uh, sometimes it was what I would never do. And sometimes it was, you know what? That's a pretty good idea. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not, I don't not. uh I'm not embarrassed to say sometimes I learn from students. I'm like, you know what? I never thought about that. Or, you know what? I never I never thought I would maybe pair those two things together. Um, you well, have sometimes to be, the person with the least experience has the most objective viewpoint. Because their perspective is so different. Yep. And so you have to be willing to, to learn that, right? Um, in 30 days, you could... You could teach the basics. I don't want to say you could scratch it, but you certainly didn't even go super in depth on the basics. You wanted to be able to take a guy and allow him to, at the end of the month, go out in the field in any condition and not worry about himself, but have the mind space to be able to think about the rest of the guys. So it's like, I've got this. Let me watch him. Let me make sure everybody else is okay. Because if everybody starts doing that, the reality is every guy is going to have a bad day. I've had dudes go down with altitude sickness and damn near literally have to carry them out of the field. Right? And so, depending on your hydration, mm -hmm. whatever it is that day. And so, if you can stop thinking about yourself and think about the mission and the guys out there with you, that that's a win like you you've moved to the next level at that point um or if you in the hunting scenario right if i can stop thinking about myself like oh it's gonna rain i need to go back to camp or it's gonna rain i got this and this is the perfect opportunity to move in on this herd and kill this yeah, i was gonna say drive on as opposed to retreat back you may begin to start to find more success than you have in the past so you know, and, and I think it's awesome. Like, it's incredible. A lot of our consumers, sick of consumers, like I call them, um, you know, hunting, uh, like hunting athletes. Yeah, that was the term I was going to use if you didn't use it. No, they, they, they are. And so they spend all this time like training, right? Thrusters, burpees, and all this kind of pack hiking and all this kind of stuff. They shoot their bows. They shoot their rifles. And it's like, but you have, so now it's time once you've dialed that, now it's time to take the next step, right? What else are you going to do? Are you going to go farther off the road? If you go farther off the road, you need to take more skills. Um, Mark, our buddy, said, you know, what if weighs a lot. And so what that means is... That's a great line. Oh, it's <laughs> that, that dude's a fucking yeah. sage, right? Yeah. But, well, but what that We're means is... We're talking about Mark Twight, who oh, okay, I'm going to yeah. have him on shortly, actually. Awesome. He agreed to do it. Yeah, he's phenomenal. No, the dude is... I love that guy. He's intense. Uh, That's he, the word that I would choose so, for So him. Mark is another guy, right? And you see a common theme here. Mark is another guy that I truly give credit for upping my game and moving me on, right? And yep. giving me opportunity. I mean, the guy is just amazing. I haven't talked to him in years, but... He's the one who introduced me to CrossFit, which changed the trajectory yep. of my life for a variety of different reasons. So he he put me in uh, he put me in two other guys. Uh, we went out to do a I think a ten day or two week trip out Salt Lake with him, and uh, it was a great excuse to go out and, and hang with Mark and fucking climb and ski and yeah just and so he gave us you know again you know I'm I'm the guy teaching and I'm going to courses and learning from guys that are teaching me. Yep, we're talking about you know, physiology and hydration and nutrition and all that. And he goes, hey, I got this new, uh, however you phrase, you know, workout routine, et cetera. Oh, okay. And it was Tabata, Tabata. Oh, God. Just your standard Tabata thing. Right? Which if people don't understand, it's eight rounds of 20 seconds of work, fill in the blank on your work, 10 seconds of rest. It takes four minutes. Yeah, and so we did row, pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups. Oh, that's that sucks. Right? And we're like, oh, you fucking get like. <laughs> We got this. And we go to what I affectionately called at the time his gulag, which was like, 
look like something out of like the Rocky movie from the first one. Yep. Like I'm surprised there wasn't a beef there that we had to like pick up or pound. Or Were you something doing lunges like in the snow with a telephone pole in your back? Yeah, <laughs> it almost got to that. And uh, what would you say it was four minutes? Four something minutes like for that. a Tabata interval. Yeah. Fucking crushed. Yeah. Crushed. And honestly, full disclosure, like I figured out like halfway through that I needed to pace myself. And the one dude who didn't, because he just went for it, because that's the kind of guy he is. Was crippled. Fucking crippled. Yeah. And he's like, I won't mention the guy's name, but he's like, oh, yeah, these world-class alpinists came in that are friends of his. And the first time I put him through a Tabata workout, like, you know, and this guy's an amazing climber. He goes, like, he couldn't hardly do any pull-ups at the end of the, yeah. know, the eight rounds. And so anyways, Mark, so, paper, so Mark introduced me hard. to CrossFit as well. Yeah. Like, actually, I like to say Mark introduced me to CrossFit before CrossFit was cool. <laughs> so I met Mark shortly after I got injured on the East Coast. Mm. He came out and did a seminar for maybe eight of us. Yeah. And it was at that time that I really dove headlong into the pool of using that as my recovery system. Mm -hmm. And then before long, I was, you know, I had my body armor back on again and I was able to hang with the guys and the people were you know like hey what is this what do you got going on it it changed it was the paradigm shift yeah it was the it was the spearhead through the wall that was the paradigm shift between the what i'll call functional training versus training for hypertrophy because yeah. when i was at team yeah. five it was chest and tries back oh, yeah. and eyes and run all day, on wednesday all day long yeah yeah i didn't know any better nobody did because you're a new guy nobody will talk to you so you just follow the biggest dude into the gym and do what he yep. does yep no, for sure. Like he, he changed my whole mindset, you know, and I think he's, he's kind of even evolved past that. And, yep. you know, depending on the time of year, I'll tweak the training that I do and work around certain injuries and stuff that I have. But, um, yeah, no, he's, he's a, he's a great dude, but I forget what I was going to say. doesn't matter. I'm sure it was very profound, but <laughs> I'm trying to kill this bottle of Patron before we end this podcast, which is not going to happen because there's like a fifth left. There is a fifth left. It was a 55-gallon drum when we started. But it had a handle when you carried it out of the store. It you did. were very happy about that. Oh, that, that was a great packaging. We were frustrated by day two. In full disclosure, we went to the liquor store and just loaded up a cart and said, all right. At like 10 a.m. Plan B. <laughs> God, man. The cool thing is, is everything you're talking about, that survival and thinking through in a system, I love the fact that I really like the fact, and I enjoy the fact that a, a lot of things from my old career have applicability into what I'm very passionate about now. Not all of them do, uh, and I have some still. I'm my huge learning curve. The biggest one for me is the wind. Yeah, because I think about it differently now. It used to be just for the ballistic coefficient mm -hmm. and how it would affect the bullet. Yeah, I mean, with a bow, with a long shot being called seventy yards. If you don't understand the wind, you're—I mean—you're completely screwed. I mean, go ahead and hunt with it quartering on your back. You're not going to see or hear or encounter anything. And like we were talking about at breakfast, I mean, I just—I <laughs> need more experience around animals. Well, yeah. So that's what I would say. Like your your process and mindset for shooting, like, dude, you—you you may not know it, and I don't know if John would disagree with me, but like your shooting ability is adv it's so incredibly advanced for how long you've been shooting a bow, right? Like, I'm hoping to get there someday. Stop, dude. And, uh, <laughs> no, seriously. And um, and you're stalking, right? So we talked, we had some yeah. interesting, funny stories about stalking, you know, military and otherwise. Just when you hear stalking, just think crawling on your face. Yeah. Um, but the difference is you've got to get around, a, like, I think... People have to get around a bunch of different species and understand how they react. Like, for me, bears are pretty easy because they can smell real good, but they really can't see for shit. That's what I was going to say. They can't see very well. I, that's been my experience. So I'm real aggressive with bears. Like, I'll move right in on them if I have the wind. Yeah. Um, these axis deer, they don't put up with a whole lot of anything. No, right? and their vision seems to be, vi well, especially the females. Maybe the guys aren't paying attention, but those females. The females are definitely saving Hundreds them. of yards. The, just the buck's life. Yeah, but, locked on. Yeah. But, you know, every species and then even depends on, you know, what time of the, the phase you're hunting them. Like September elk oh, is different rut, than yeah. October elk. Like it just is. And uh, 
and I certainly haven't hunted everything or hunted them enough, but like I thought mule deer was pretty tough with the bow. Right? I've yet to hunt mule deer, so hopefully. I and I got to tell you, mule deer August. compared to axis deer, like the perspective now, it's like I got this. Well, you said that they will they'll bolt out, but then they'll stop. I have I have had really good luck if I've blown a mule deer out. That they will their their Achilles heel, in my opinion, is they'll run 40, 50 yards, and they'll stop broadside and look back to see what the threat was. If you know, if, assuming they didn't wind you. Yeah. Well, the axis will do the same thing. It's just they run four or five miles. That's the problem, right? <laughs> yeah. And they run four or five miles through like double overhead oh, brush, and so you can't get a follow up. Um, but, but I know that. So if I blow a deer out, and it doesn't happen every time, but if I blow a mule deer out, I come first thing I do is come to full draw, and in my mind I'm calculating like. 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards. Wait he's for at that 40, stop. He's at 45 yards. And I have been probably more successful than I should be because <laughs> of that. Um, and I kept hoping, like, these deer, you know, you blow one out but not super hard, and you're like, ah, the axis deer will stop. No. Not even close. I mean, they will. Like I said, just miles away. Yeah, miles, they, miles away. I would watch uh, when we were separated. I would watch, or I could see when – that one day that you took a couple shots. Yeah. I would watch how Yeah, that was pretty cool you got to watch that. For whatever reason, I happened to look up twice, and I saw you at full draw. And the animals that moved, I was at least, I was at least a mile from you. Mm-hmm. And they were still running as they passed proximate to where I was to, until they disappeared another mile that I was watching. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything more skittish in these things. I mean, hunted year-round, what is it? They're from India? I think so. And I'm so they kind of evolved, the like the all, yeah. DNA has like evolved to, you know, avoid Bengal tigers or something. Yeah, they have no blood. So they have no blood. <laughs> we've, we've proven that multiple God. times. So I'm like, you know, I feel like a, I'm kind of a badass. I, I killed three. So basically, I'm kind of as good as a Bengal tiger. Or I was three times. Yeah. Um, no, they're, they're tough, man. And they're not like super big target either. Shoot a 700-pound elk at... 60 yards it's like you know i can do that shoot a little doe I'd be more than happy my shot last year was 42 yards i'd be more than happy to get that shot again oh my god and i was in bushes in the shadow like i was completely that thing had no idea i was there yeah we weren't like we weren't like newbie stalkers like you know to use dead space you know to use the shadows and yeah when you can move when you can't move exactly yeah no it was fun like i said it was not fun. I, got, I, got, I used the other F. Well, I got, I got to sleep on it, and I'm like, yeah, I need to come back. Now. Yeah, Because it will make boat. you a better hunter. There is no doubt in my mind this has made me a better bow hunter. I, I'm in the same boat. Every I, I will go to bed frustrated, and I wake up, and it's like, okay, what can I do to make this better? Yeah. I'm not going to give up because I'm not tuned that way, but. No, to me, it <sighs> makes me it makes me more driven. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if I can shoot any more days a year because I shoot not every day, but yeah. a lot. But I need to be smarter, right? And I need to think through my process. We're talking gear. We're at breakfast this morning. We're, what could we do different? Like, what about this? What about that? There's got to be. And so what was getting us is a way to crawl with your bow that's not cumbersome. Yeah. As opposed to like doing the, I won't use the term that Mark used <laughs> for crawling along with it. But like you try to lay it on your back. But as your scapula moves, it tries to bounce side to side. Yeah. I call it the three F's of uh, bow hunting fun yeah good i hope yeah fun should lead the way frustration yeah. frustration absolutely i forget what the other f was god damn it you just used it a second ago i don't know that was the third f fantasy <laughs> <laughs> no it was fun and frustration man that's i think it's the pendulum that swings back and forth yeah our our friend uh do we use her first name kimmy yeah kimmy yeah um I told her last oh, night. Oh, failure. That's I, the other F. Yeah, yeah. How There's, can you forget that? Well, frustra- it's well you. Failure is on the far left of the pe- pendulum. Yep. Frustration is the middle. And, and fun. Occasionally it swings to fun and then disappears. Yeah. I, but I told Kimmy last night at dinner, I said, I said, strap in. I said, you are on for a lifetime ride. Yeah. You'll never master this. It'll always be something you can work on. But you will have, like, it will, it's just so awesome to be, what I like about bow hunting and people don't understand maybe who don't do it is even though you're trying to kill the animal getting that close yeah into their wheelhouse and being able to see how they 
react and and interact in their daily life and stuff and the different sounds they make and like dude it's super cool and every species is completely different than the next yeah to get to 30 yards and be able to watch a herd of animals that doesn't know that you're there in their normal environment i'll call it just in their bedroom it's pretty cool how far did we crawl yesterday on that one stalk it, it felt like a country mile to me. The one where I got the actual shot off and painted that arrow tip to tail and we yeah. could find nothing? Yeah. I mean, that shot was 41 yards. You you and Jason were so far ahead. You know, I lost sight of you at one point. Yeah. And I'm like, I may just use this as an excuse to lay down and take a nap. <laughs> and then eventually I'll stand up and I'll see you if I hear the bow go off. Jason would like, keep Jesus. crawling and he'd look back and he'd give me this hand signal of like, come on. And it's like, listen, I'm coming on. You're just crawling faster. And he didn't even have knee pads. I'm like, dude, what's up? Savage. The guy's a ninja. I yeah. told you, he's a ninja, man. He's a local, for sure. It's, uh, God, yeah. What he a great put me show, on man. three bucks in two hours two days ago. Yeah, those are the ones that I was watching. I literally yeah. would happen to look up, and there you are at full draw as the guy was jogging by in his orange shirt. Which he's like, oh, there. And, you know, he's avoiding every doe on the way. Yeah, which I had no ability to do. No. Yeah. All right, man. We've actually been at this for almost two hours. I know. We need to go and we gotta pack. check out. Yep. All and right. Finish the tequila. We'll do round two again then. All right, man. We're done. Ready? Yeah. We're done. And that's all for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Do me a favor. Go to iTunes and write a review for the podcast. I would like to know what you think. John, if you're still listening to yourself talk or the podcast that you were talking on at this point, go to iTunes and write the review you said you were going to write. Just saying. No, but for everybody else, I want to make this as good as it can be. I, to do that, I need outside and external and objective feedback. So give it to me. Send me an email if you want to, if it's terrible. I I honestly don't care if you post a terrible review. I will listen to it. And look at it objectively. There are certain things that I can control and certain things that I cannot. If you don't like the sound of my voice, well, I don't know what I can do for you. If you'd like to hear from a different category of guests, maybe there's something I can do about that. So tell me what you think. Everybody tells me it's important. In all honesty, I don't know necessarily why it is important. I think it might have to do with how it shows up in your in your search bar. If you search for the podcast, I really don't know. But... I like it because it gives me the feedback that allows me to make the podcast better. And that's it. Oh, and the stickers are out. I just released the stickers because people kept asking me for stickers. I ordered 100. When they're gone, they're gone. And we're about halfway through that. So if you want to get a sticker, go to clearedhotpodcast.com. There's a little tab up top that says shop. Click on shop, find the sticker, buy the sticker if you want. And if you don't, that's cool too. And that's it. See you next week with episode 36.